fifth episode of Surviving the Survivor. We bring you the best guests in all of true crime. Don't forget to subscribe and smash that like button. Here's your host, Emmy Award-winning broadcaster, Joel Waldman. And what's up, STS Nation? Uh, welcome to another episode of Surviving the Survivor, the podcast that promises to bring you the very best guests in all of true crime. And uh, tonight, a very, very special show. Uh, it has been more than two months since a Maryland mom of five's body was found near a hiking trail where she went missing and was ultimately found murdered. The Hartford County Sheriff, Jeff Gaylor, says that Rachel Morin's death was a result of a violent homicide. Her family wants your help to catch the killer who's been on the loose, as we've said, for more than a month. And uh, just quick, uh, quick note here. We're having some big storms overhead in Miami. So uh, if you see me flicker or cut out for a moment, we will come back on. But bear with us um, as I'm juggling a couple of things here uh, solo. But uh, best guests today are extraordinary. Uh, you're looking at Nate Morin with the yellow flowers. He is Rachel's brother. Uh, this is the first interview that he has given to anyone regarding uh, Rachel's murder. And we really appreciate him being here and coming on. And I know he's got a little, a few jitters uh, speaking publicly for the first time, but uh, no better community than STS Nation to warmly welcome him. And then we've got uh, Matthew McMahon uh, with the green flowers that look beautiful right behind our tree or plant, whatever that is, a plant, I guess. Uh, he is the father of Rachel's oldest child. Uh, he is joining us as well. And then some familiar faces. Uh, Scott Duffy, of course, everyone knows him. I don't even write his biography down because I know it so well. A supervisory agent uh, in the Delaware office, uh, not far from where all of this played out. And, uh, of course, a Commonwealth of Pennsylvania police officer before then, but uh, a great investigative mind. And uh, Scott came on last minute at my request because there are some developments. Um, and I told both Doug and Scott uh, that the focus, of course, is going to be on Nate and Matt today, but they will be here to guide us as well. And, of course, Doug McGregor, better known as the Geo Profiler. He's a forensic behavioral analyst and a consultant specializing in geographic profiling and linkage analysis for violent crime and missing persons. Uh, he has a master of science from Missouri State University, and he lives in Ottawa, Canada with his wife and his two children, two children. So we welcome everyone here. Uh, of course, uh, I've got to worry about something every day today. I'm worried about these storms overhead, but uh, we are going to continue on. As, they, as though they don't exist. And uh, Nate, obvious first question to you, and we'll dive deeper into it um, in a little bit, but just how is the family doing? How are you doing? It's been more than two months. Um, how is everyone holding up? Um, well, not to sound cliche, but, you know, hurting, you know, some are angry, some are sad, you know, depressed, um, waves of emotion, you know, um, a lot of frustration. Um, we can get into that deeper, but, you know, two months, you know, even though it's uh, a case like this, two months seems like a long time. And that's kind of where we're at right now. And that's what our emotions are surrounded with. Yeah. And, and Nate, just for full disclosure, I, you know, we talked last night on the phone uh, just to go over a few things. And I was on court TV with your sister, Aaron, this morning. So the case, you know, we're trying to push it to get as much, uh, public attention as possible. Uh, Dan Abrams, who I used to work for um, when he was at MSNBC, I, I've heard him on News Nation saying that he's incredulous at the fact that this case has not been solved yet. We can obviously get Scott and Doug's take on that in a little bit, but I don't think people realize sort of the hell uh, that you've been to and back prior to Rachel's uh, murder. Um, if you're comfortable, and I asked you, and I think you are, um, you're first wife passed away not that long ago um can you tell us from what and then what happened most recently with your child right before rachel's murder uh yes with my late wife um she was diagnosed with uh stage four cancer um around february of the year she passed and uh 
pretty, pretty sudden decline. Um, they said maybe two years. Um, she had nine months, uh, passed away in that November. Um, pretty painful. Uh, that's the first real close loss that I've suffered in my life, other than my father, uh, years before. Um, and then, uh, yeah, our young daughter, um, passed away four months old, passed away from SIDS. Um, and we buried her on the Friday and it was the following Saturday. We found out Rachel had gone missing and it was the Sunday after that. It was, uh, related to us that she was found and she had passed. And, uh, Nate, I mean, my heart aches for you just hearing that, um, we had heard news reports early on because I've been on this story uh, from day one that a family member uh, had lost a child. I did not realize till I talked to you last night that it was you. So praying for, you know, you and your family, uh, your late child and, of course, your late wife. Um, Tali is coming to us from Israel uh, where they are dealing with missile strikes and uh, just seems like the world is upside down right now. But uh, she says from Israel, praying for Rachel and her family, hoping justice will prevail. Uh, and then going on to say, Tali says, sorry for your uh, loss, Nate. So uh, STS Nation, let's try to lift up the Morin family here and the McMahon family. Um, and look at this. Maytree here says, don't worry, Nathan. This is the most caring, loving, supportive community in the world. We got you. Um, Matt McMahon, same question to you. Um, how are you doing? Uh, it's been over two months. Um, I assume you were expecting a little more resolution in this case, but you know, mentally, uh, how are you holding up? And of course, uh, Nate's mom and uh, your ex-mother-in-law, Patty, uh, more. And how's everyone doing? Um, I'll, I'll speak about myself uh, first. Um, dealing with something like this is, is, at least for me, has been kind of like sprinting a marathon. Um, I really was hoping that this was, was going to be concluded at this point so that we we so that I uh, could have this closure for both myself and, and my daughter and her other children. Um, now that I'm seeing what's, what feels like uh, a lag in the case, I'm not really seeing much progress. I'm feeling a little bit hopeless, um, a little bit distraught, um, feeling a little bit exhausted uh, from, you know, the, the two plus months of, of no real answers. I mean, it's at the end of the day, we've really only had, great answers since, uh, you know, week two of the investigation when they uh, announced that they had the DNA linked to the suspect in uh, uh, to, to L.A. Um, my daughter, she's, she's doing a little bit better. Um, at first, um, she was withdrawing a lot uh, from the world, uh, choosing to stay home, uh, not spending much time with her friends, uh, only really, really spending time with her boyfriend. Um, but then on Thursday, the two month anniversary, um, she actually decided to go out for a, a hike on a, a trail with her boyfriend, uh, not in Bel Air. Um, and that gave me a lot of hope for her, um, because the, the fact that it was a two month anniversary and she was choosing to go on a trail that, that really, that really seemed to be a, a challenge to the suspect from my daughter saying that you're not going to take me too. Um, so I feel that she's doing better. Um, you know, her next oldest child, which is not my child, uh, but I love very much. She's, she's doing well. Uh, she's getting straight A's in school. She, she's 13. Um, she's making new friends. Um, she's, uh, she's been seeing a, a counselor at school and she's going to be adding a, a grief counselor, uh, this month. So I also feel very hopeful for her as well. Um, but we're all yeah. trying to do the best we can. And uh, I know you sent me a note and uh, I thought what you said was uh, right on target, which was, you know, your child and Rachel's child going on that hike is about as on that same trail is about as strong as uh, of a rebuke as uh, you could give to the killer. So I hope it, it was uh, a separate trail, separate trail. OK, it was but not still, the same trail. OK, but still was, the fact, you know. She got up and, and did that. That's uh, saying something to that killer out there. Um, Scott Duffy, to you, before we get into investigative stuff, and then I'll toss it to Doug in the same way. You just heard Matt saying he feels a little hopeless, uh, a little bit dejected. Um, what do you say to him as an FBI, former FBI agent? Um, 
and, and you know, you know how investigations can take more time than families would like. What do you say right now to keep his spirits up? Uh, eternal hope. And it's not so much what is said, but how it's said. And so I hope, first and foremost, prayers for you both. And I do hope as there's not a lot of information being said, I have hoped that a lot of stuff is being done. And sometimes law enforcement has a problem communicating that to the victim's families, which doesn't mean anything or to take away from a department, but sometimes they just need a little bit of tweaking in providing that shoulder saying, we can't provide information or as things are happening, there's not something to say every day, but know that the case is moving forward every day. And I will say two months seems like a long time to you both. A day is too long, but in this specific type of case with what they have already found now begins where it's a slower process as opposed to a DNA link in CODIS, which in many regards has a name attached to it. This is one of those exceptions where a name's not attached to it. So thereby, I guarantee you, a name will be attached to it. It's now just um, it's a waiting game. Uh, you see here, uh, anyone with any information, we're trying to help out as a public service as well. You can contact the Hartford County Sheriff's Office. You see the number there, 410-836-7788 or RM Tips, RM Tips at HartfordSheriff.org. There are people in the Bel Air area who watch this show. So uh, if you see anything and keep in mind, this suspect could literally be anywhere right now. I'm going to play this video of the suspect as I move over to Doug here. Uh, Doug, you're just going to want to unmute yourself. But um, Doug, not for me and not for the audience, but for Nate and Matt, just kind of explain what you do and how you go about catching, um, you know, violent criminals. Sure. So, you know, uh, Nathan and Matt, I mean, it's nice to meet you both. Uh, we met backstage a few minutes ago, but, uh, you know, just to reiterate what uh, what Scott said, I'm you know, I'm sorry for what you both are going through and your families are going through. Uh, you know, I'm a husband, father, brother myself, so uh, I can only imagine how hard it is. Um, to be honest, I uh, before I say what I do, it, it just, you know, I, I had second thoughts about coming on the show and not because I don't love being on Joel's show, but because I, I work a lot with families. Um, and just so you both know, uh, all my all my services provided to families are all pro bono. So if you're ever interested in the future, you can definitely reach out. Um, but the way I discuss with families and the way I discuss with, you know, without families present or with law enforcement, a more matter of fact way, it's just it, it was I was wondering how to word things, how to word questions in front of family members in a public forum. So um, I haven't I haven't done that before. So that kind of, you know, that was a. Uh, um, it just, it was in the back of my head coming on the show today. So I, I hope any, any questions I answer today, you know, don't come off insensitive in any, in any way. Um, uh, but what I do is I do geographic profiling. So it's a, it's a subset of behavioral analysis. Uh, and I look specifically at, you know, space, time, uh, environment and geography, um, relative to an offender, uh, a victim, so victimology, um, or the crime scene itself. Uh, and as Joel mentioned, I work uh, serial and violent crime. I work a lot of missing persons cases for families, and I work a lot of uh, um, locating uh, clandestine graves or body recovery for families as well. So that's just you know quickly some of the things, some of the activities that I do. Yeah. And uh, by the way, just to echo what Doug was just saying, you know, I had some uh, trepidation about bringing uh, two other people on with Nate and Matt. Uh, typically when 
a news person, you know, gets the family on. Uh, but I really want to try to help Nate and Matt, and I'm not in this for ratings. And I thought it'd be great for them to meet Scott and Doug and also have an opportunity for Matt and uh, Nate to ask them questions. So uh, Matt and Nate, you know, this is this is the beauty of uh, – did court TV yesterday with Tim Jansen, who's always on the show. And he texted me right after and he goes, what was that? He goes, it was over in three seconds. I couldn't say anything. That's what traditional media is. This is not traditional media. So Matt and Nate, if you have any questions for Scott um, or Doug at any point, this is not formal. Just jump in, ask away. Cause um, you know, if I was in your situation, I would definitely want to pick these, uh, the, 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 their minds. They've got really, uh, Amazing investigative mind. So moving on to some of the news, and then we'll circle back to everything else. Um, Sheriff Jeff Gaylor, uh, Nate, and I'll come to you on this. He, he did mention um, on News Nation that they had gone down to Washington, D.C., just a little bit further south, and said that there was a quote unquote person of interest. Um, you, until I talked to you, when I talked to you last night, said you hadn't even heard about this. How did you how did you find out about it? Um, and were you surprised to hear it? Um, I found out by you <laughs> uh, when we talked. Um, and I'm usually pretty good at keeping up on every piece of media that's been going out. You know, I stay in contact with all my family, like who's going on, who's doing what. And, you know, I watch every single piece and follow the sheriff. And, you know, I mean, somehow I guess I missed that one. <laughs> And Matt, had you heard, and this is just, uh, you know, a glimpse into the world of victims' families here for STS Nation, and I know a lot of you uh, who are watching are also uh, victims uh, in your own right, but this is, you know, unfortunately how things play out. So Nate, who is Rachel's brother, didn't even know about this possible person of interest, but Matt, how did you find out about it? I heard about it on News Nation uh, at the same time the general public did. Um which is uh, sometimes I, I learn some information ahead of time, but sometimes um, I learn it in tandem, tandem with the, you know, the general public. Um, when I was on News Nation uh, probably about a week and a half ago, um, I learned information while I was sitting in front of the camera. That's amazing. So, Scott, I'm going to come to you next. Here's a quote from uh, Sheriff Jeff Gaylor. The investigators were working a lead. This was not the result of a tip. This was a result of evidence related to the crime leading our investigators into the D.C. metro area where they interviewed an individual relevant to this investigation. It is not a suspect, but hopefully somebody who can point us in the right direction to identifying that person. Um, before we get to the context of that quote, um, what about the fact that, you know, Nate found out from me. Is that disconcerting to you or is that the way law enforcement should be handling these cases? Hmm. No, that's, that's, it's, uh, that's the negative aspect to, to operating like this. So information is not going to be fed on a daily or weekly basis, but there should be set standard of, okay, do we have one point of contact who can then provide the information relevant uh, that was just said or just learned to the rest of the family members? That's typically the way it should be. And, and, and it could be, let's just say it's a weekly meeting, Friday, Thursday, whatever have you, and it may be there's nothing new and that's that in of itself is information, which is good. However, if somebody is going to go and reveal information in a public forum that hasn't yet been provided to a victim's family, that can be it, it's just it can be taken so many different ways and often negatively as opposed to, oh, great, I learned something. So the. Um, I, I've always tried to make sure, and I think many agencies sometimes get caught in the, in the mix here, where if such a high-profile case, and this is gaining the notoriety which it needs because of the transient nature of this of this killer, that um, there should be 
And I'm even saying to the family through Randolph, if I imagine Randolph is still the point of contact as an attorney, that th any information like that that may get to a news agency and then go out, it should have already been vetted through the family. And that's just that just should be uh, an SOP, mm. if that makes sense. Yeah, it definitely does. And, and what about what do you make of the uh, kind of the reading between the lines here that this guy, they, first of all, they got this from a lead, not from a tip. And I think over a thousand tips have come in, but they're saying they they got it from a lead and this person is not a suspect. I mean, this has got to be an associate then or someone who might know this person. Uh, what are you reading into it, Scott? Yeah, I mean, it sounds pretty much what what the sheriff had said, that it was a lead and leads are developed through. Uh, a variety of ways. It could be going through the phone. It could be going through something of a um, on camera. It could be something so distant that there might have been somebody spotted on a camera, perhaps a license plate, and uh, and detectives feel that's necessary enough that could be um, related to the investigation, and so they find this individual. Uh, perhaps surveilling this individual and then uh, find reason to interview this individual and see if in fact they're on the right track. There's this piece of evidence from either the crime, crime scene or their subsequent supplemental investigation lead them to this person in DC. And, uh, and so thereby um, something that is proof positive, it may come to a screeching halt and wind up to be um a red herring and and it took them in a different direction nevertheless take the positive out of it that um that they are following up on things no matter where it takes them and uh if they spent days chasing down a lead that ends up bringing them no closer to finding rachel's killer the good thing is is that they are doing things um as 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 things come through and so um it's it's positive, right? But it at the end of the day, it could also um, wind up being nothing. But but the hope is in that specific statement from the sheriff is that uh, they're they're moving forward with what and not just waiting for that that magical name to pop up into a, a DNA database. Mm -hmm. And uh, for those who are new to the case, uh, there was. Uh a sexual assault in Los Angeles. That's what this uh, video, I'm not going to bring it up now because I want to get to this comment, but uh, there's a connection with a sexual assault of a young girl in Los Angeles. And when they ran uh, the DNA, that's how they found that out. But they have a DNA hit in what is known as CODIS, which is a federal database, but they don't have an identity on that DNA, which is why it's been hard to catch this person. But Matt, and I'll eventually circle back to, to Doug here. Um, Sherry says, Matt, I live in Carroll County, Maryland, which I'm not sure how far that is from you, but I will not walk the trails by myself anymore, always in a group of three or more. What is the sense on the ground, at least in the Bel Air area? I mean, are women in particular uh, fearful? Are they going out in groups? Are they not hiking alone, fearing that this person could strike again? Um, I'm definitely hearing that from some individuals that um, they do not want to go out on trails uh, solo, which is definitely a good idea uh, to, to go out there in groups uh, or bring a pepper spray, a, a whistle, uh, but also at the same time during our canvassing, uh, we would witness uh, you know, some women going and walking on, on the trail with young children. Um, the one I'm, I'm thinking of right now was a Hispanic woman who had no idea that there was even an attack on the trail. Um, so, I'm seeing uh, a little bit of everything in the Bel Air community uh, in terms of how people are responding to going out on trails. I myself have, have not gone on that trail uh, since uh, about week two when there was a, a remembrance walk where everybody laid flowers. And it was also the same with my daughter. I, I don't think she's been on the trail since that day either. Mm -hmm. uh, Josh M here saying, stay strong, Nate. Uh, Nate, I was kind of... Uh amazed to find out how many siblings uh, Rachel has. Can you just break down sort of the family dynamics? I don't think people realize uh, how many siblings she has. Uh, yeah, we got uh, quite a few here. Um, <laughs> got um, 
four brothers, uh, one half brother, um, Rebecca sister, and then Aaron, uh, she's half <clears throat> Josh and Aaron are my dad's first, uh, marriage there, but we all lived in the <clears throat> Harford County area together. Uh, Doug, to you, uh, you kind of gave me a, a list, which I really appreciate before going on the show. One of the things you talk about is victimology. Let's kind of go through that uh, as it pertains to victimology and this suspect, this sick individual. Um, what do you read into the victimology? Uh, so in this case, victimology would be focusing on on Rachel and, you know, what led her to the circumstances that she, you know, ultimately ended up in um and how the offender you know picked picked rachel as a victim so you know when, when i when i look at victimology when i create a profile i need to learn everything about that person that individual um you know their their behaviors you know where they live where they work uh where they go their timeline uh some important things to to sort out the timeline the last known position uh the place last seen so when i look at this case here there's a there's a lot of um there's a lot of information that that and i've looked through as many sources as i can find and there's a lot of information that's just not there yet which is uh which makes it hard on my end um, now some of that information law enforcement might have some they might not um the I think the grayest area in terms of the profile that I've started so far is, is the timeline itself. Um, the, the only cert in terms of the timeline, the only, um, the only certainty I have is that, that I've seen is that she was at uh, glow at 2 PM after that, it gets kind of gray. Um, and, and, you know, I'm, I'm not pointing fingers here, but it just right now, it seems like, that there's this one individual, her, her boyfriend, who kind of has the timeline right now. So he's kind of dictating what the timeline is. And that doesn't mean he's guilty by any means, but he's just the person that saw her after 2 p.m. So um, in terms of where she was at five o'clock, uh, when she went to the trail at six o'clock, and then the 911 call uh, close to midnight. Um, and I've been trying to fill some of those gaps, but uh, there's, I haven't seen, I haven't seen anybody that can place her at the park from six to seven thirty in that time zone. I haven't seen any um, any statements released by law enforcement that a witness was able to place. Her. I've seen them looking for witnesses, but nobody that was actually able to place her there. So, uh, you know, by all accounts, it seems like she was there and she went for a run. But uh, but th those things are important because, you know, that, that then you create that timeline. Um, other other things that uh, that are important here are, you know, why was why was she selected? Uh, ultimately, we don't know. Uh, it could have been opportunistic. The person could have been in that area at that time. Um, there's there's a lot of things I look at when I create my profile. I obviously look at the environment. I looked at the trail. Uh, there's a lot of things that I would, you know, do in terms of when you when you create a, a, a trail environment like that, a leisure environment, there's, you know, things you take into account, which need to be improved in this area, you know, lighting, surveillance, making it a loop as opposed to one way, that kind of thing. Um, but I'm also looking at access points as well. How was she selected? You know, was she was she on a run? Was it a body dump site as opposed to a run? Um, and so, you know, I, I've found that there's just a lot of uh, a lot a lot of gaps there in the in the in the timeline, and then a lot of questions as um, uh, surrounding the environment as to where she was found. Yeah, and and Matt, I I want to let you chime in because I know one of the things that was bothering you a little bit was were people sort of suggesting at least at the onset um, or insinuating that uh, Rachel's boyfriend, uh, Richard Tobin may have had something to do with it. Uh, he appears to have been cleared through DNA here, but like you to just be able to respond to that. And by the way, Angela Ray or Angel Ray, I should say is watching us from uh, Sydney. Um, Nightwood here says 
Uh, waiting is so nerve-wracking, almost cruel. Deb McCall, Matt, keep hope alive. My thoughts and prayers go out to you and your daughter. Um, but just want to give you a chance to respond uh, to that information as well as uh, New Zealand in the house here. Go ahead, Matt. Sure. And uh, in speaking with my daughter, um, Rachel had been in a relationship with Richard for probably about 10 weeks. Um, uh, and from what I'm told, uh, she very much hoped that he was the one. She was very much in love with Richard. Uh, she had given Richard uh, a key to her house, wanted to, to spend pretty much every day with Richard. Um, uh, she had asked my daughter multiple times to go on a double date uh, with Richard. Uh, you know, my daughter, her, her boyfriend, uh, and, and Rachel and Richard. And I view that as, as Rachel seeking approval from my daughter for, for Richard. Um, so I, I completely believe that uh, they were truly in love. A lot of people feel that it was truly a, a very new relationship just because they had only gone Facebook official. Uh, I think it was the Tuesday before uh, Rachel was found. Um, and I have been told that was actually Rachel's idea. Rachel wanted to go Facebook official. Uh, so this relationship was very important to Rachel from everything that I've been told by uh, my daughter and other people that are close to Rachel. Um, I would like to also speak uh, a little bit to uh, uh, the fact that Rachel truly did go for a run on that trail. Uh, when I arrived to that trail uh, that Sunday morning, my daughter had pointed out that Rachel was parked in her usual spot. So when Rachel went for a run, that was one specific spot that she parked in and that's where her vehicle was and her wallet was in, in, in the vehicle. So everything that I have heard points to the fact that she legitimately went to that trail for a run that day and she, she was attacked probably, uh, I'm estimating a good half mile down the trail. So I don't see that as, you know, a dump site. Um, that would be a really long way to, to really venture into the trail for something like that. Um, and Rachel, you know, she, she went for runs on that trail a lot. She had been going on uh, runs uh, and walks on that trail for decades. She grew up right around uh, the corner, you know, just a couple hundred feet from the trailhead. So she knew that trail uh, very well. Um, me and Rachel actually used to take our daughter uh, on bike rides and walks on that trail when she was very young. Um, I'll pull up some photos here of uh, Rachel and, and some of these photos have not been released as far as I know but uh, Nate I'm looking at this picture on the left and looking at you uh, you guys look pretty similar actually she's a little better looking than you no offense to you Nate but um, tell That's us fine. <laughs> <laughs> tell, tell me a Rachel story um, you know tell just what do you think of Rachel you know what what's a what, what's a funny story that just kind of pops into your head right away? You know, that there's really not a Rachel story. I mean, we, we all have them, but, um, and not to sound well, corny or cheesy, but Rachel was her own story. Um, you know, I hosted <clears throat> my wife and I, we hosted the holidays at our house and it was a big to do lots of food, you know, great beverages, um, lots of family games, I mean, loud, obnoxious, and fun. And <clears throat> out of all that, you know, Rachel was pretty much the center of attention, you know, always rolling in two hours late, but simply gorgeous in what she was wearing. Um, just the life that flowed out of this tiny girl, um, her laugh, her smile, her jokes, um, all of that is just, you know, the consistency of who she's always been um, as a woman here. Beautifully put. Uh, here are some photos of uh, a younger Matt McMahon and uh, Rachel as well. Uh, Matt, when you see these photos, well, you know, what what does it bring to mind? And here you are with uh, your child. Yeah. Um, Rachel gave me the best part of my life. And actually, I owe the gratitude to, to, to Rachel, but I also owe, owe to Nate. Um, your viewers probably don't realize that, that Nate introduced me to uh, Rachel. Um, he actually asked me several times to, to go on a date with Rachel and I, and I kept saying no. Um, I thought it was actually quite strange to have a, a brother encourage, uh, his friend to, to, to begin dating his, uh, his sister. Uh, so that was a little bit of a, a struggle for me. Um, 
then uh, finally I did go on a, a double date with uh, Nate and his girlfriend and uh, me and Rachel. Um, and yeah, we had a great time and, and you know, a lot of fun. Uh, Rachel was being uh, really goofy. Uh, I didn't include the photo, um, but um, during uh, that date, um, uh, we were posing for some photos and uh, she just kept uh, goofing off. Uh, it, it took probably a good 10 to 15 pictures before we could actually uh, get a, um, what I consider a good photo because she just kept making faces and, and making funny sounds and, and wanting to be the jokester that, that Rachel was. Um, but seeing the pictures that you have on the screen right now, uh, that definitely brings back uh, a lot of memories. We uh, went to, uh, um, with Rachel's family to an apple orchard uh, that day uh, and had a great day. Um, and uh, just about a week ago, uh, we were all back at the uh, apple orchard again with uh, a lot of Rachel's family, you know, my daughter and my daughter's boyfriend. Um, so it brings back a lot of memories. Mm. Uh, Henshi Held is coming to us from Jerusalem. We are, in fact, a global audience here. Uh, Henshi, hope you're staying safe here. Jerusalem is an absolute ghost town, which is sad. Um, he writes, I'm sure law enforcement is keeping information close to the vest, but I don't understand why they won't release a full face picture of him. Uh, Matt, have you been able to, is that frustrating to you? And I'm going to um, take this off here. I'm also going to put this up. This is the newest flyer, and you'll see there's now a $30,000 reward. Before we get to the flyer, Matt, um, what about, you know, have you asked why they didn't, at, at the very least, sketch this suspect's face? I do not have an answer uh, for that. I, I do believe that the police should be able to provide more information uh, that they have not uh, without jeopardizing the case. Um, they should be able to tell us... Um, you know, was the suspect speaking English, you know, uh, uh, you know, just good English, uh, clean English? Uh, was he speaking Spanish? Was he speaking English with a Spanish accent? Um, there a lot of people have said that the suspect does not have a tattoo on him. Uh, I would like the police to confirm that. Maybe he has a tattoo on his chest or his face that we don't know. And, and they haven't made a comment about that. Um, I feel like there's a lot of information that the police could potentially give about the suspect that is not obvious from the, these two photos or the video that they just haven't given us yet that might be able to direct people into giving better tips um, because I do see a lot of uh, what I consider, consider bad tips coming in. And what about this flyer? This is a newly released flyer, and I think uh, it's got Pat Brown, the uh, well-known criminal profiler, uh, the profile that she kind of put together, some bullet points. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, I had reached out to Pat Brown at the end, end of August. I saw a, a quick educational video that she had released uh, intended for law enforcement, but she was using Rachel's case as an example. Uh, and she had mentioned uh, how she strongly believed that the police should uh, release bullet points to better target uh, who the suspect would be instead of just really bad photos. And, and realistically, I, I feel these are, are not good photos. They're better than no photo, but they're not great photos. It's not even a good side shot of the suspect's face. So um, I spoke with Pat Brown for about an hour and a half on the phone, at the end of which she agreed to, to write these five bullet points pro bono. Um, I obviously uh, immediately uh, agreed. Uh, in a couple of days, she sent over a, a rough copy of the flyer, I distributed it over to the family so that they could review it. I, I wouldn't want to release anything without the, the family knowing about it. Um, and then the family in turn uh, sent that over to the detective to make sure that releasing this would not uh, create any issues with uh, the investigation. And I heard back from the family probably within about 30 minutes saying that the detective was okay with this being released. Um, so these five bullet points uh, better identify who the suspect would be, uh, meaning that the, the suspect was not anywhere that anybody would know uh, on uh, August 5th between 6th and dusk, which would have been about 8 p.m. that day, uh, identifying the different psychopathic uh, traits uh, that the individual would likely uh, have, you know, uh, a narcissist, uh, uh, a liar, uh, a lack of empathy, um, well, you can see all the, the five points on there, but that would help 
uh, provide high quality tips instead of what I'm seeing, where sometimes somebody will send me a picture of a Hispanic male that's walking down the street that is suspicious. Um, and there's, I, I don't know what's suspicious about somebody just walking down the street. Um, I've had, you know, tips come my way saying this looks like the suspect, but the, the person that they're photographing uh, is clearly six feet tall. You know, it doesn't fit the physical characteristics. So that's why Pat Brown helped create this flyer to hopefully give us better tips. Uh, I'm hearing from the uh, Sheriff Gaylor's uh, office that they have about a thousand tips. Uh, I haven't heard any comments back from the Sheriff's Department saying that any of these tips have actually resulted in anything. Uh, if you refer back to his comments about Washington, D.C., he said this was not a result of tips. So that makes me think maybe they're getting a lot of low quality tips and maybe that's uh, eating up some of their resources. And uh, the suspect appears to be a, a ghost at the moment. Um, I'm going to put this flyer out on Twitter. So uh, please follow me at podcast STS at podcast STS. I'll also put it out on our Instagram page at surviving the survivor. Um, that's an easy one to find at surviving the survivor and at podcast STS for Twitter. Um, take this down for a moment matches very quickly while uh, you're still going on this. Sherry says we have a large Latino community in Carroll County, Maryland. How do I get flyers to post to them? Um, Sherry, if you reach out to me, the one way is surviving the survivor at gmail.com. And then I can, uh, put you through to Matt with his permission, but Matt, what is a good way to do this? Uh, well, I do know that Pat Brown had uh, offered to send flyers to anybody that had reached out to her, her information's, uh, likely out there. Um, but, uh, I think posting it to, to Twitter is fine. Uh, I know that I, I frequently post these images to my Facebook and make it public. Um, I'm open to suggestions of how anybody would like to receive this information. Um, Scott Duffy, to you, um, one of the things that you've talked about uh, in the past that uh, the FBI uses is something called VICAP. Uh, what is that? Should that be... Uh, being used in this case? Do you think it's being used? Do you think, you know, we don't know, at least I don't know if uh, the feds are involved and I don't know if Matt or uh, Nate do, but your thoughts on VICAP? Yeah, so I don't know if the FBI is involved. I hope the FBI is involved for, for just the resources. And I can only imagine knowing that there is a, there, at least throughout my career, there's always been a very close relationship, um, pretty much from Delaware down to um, through Baltimore, very close relationship between the uh, local, state, federal agencies. So with that being said, I would hope that it is. Vi so VICAP is within the law enforcement community, uh, run through the FBI, and it basically is violent incident uh, criminal apprehension program. Every state has one in the United States. It is, um, and there are individual departments, uh, detectives or patrol, wh whoever is designated as the go-to person, the, po the, the point of contact for a particular state or region. And ultimately their goal is to ensure, because there is a great rigorous protocol of putting information in, as Douglas talked about the victimology, the, um, there will be these, these uh, it's a checklist. And one of them will be, hey, here's a multi-page and get the questions answered. Every member of the family would get one, particular, typically a detective um, or an agent would go out and have a sit down. And I've done these myself where you have a sit down and you ask every imaginable question, uh, but sticking to the script. It's a very well-scripted victimology report that then gets sent back to VICAP, which is ultimately scrubbing through um, the, uh, the, the, the actual victim. And then of course, the actual circumstances uh, surrounding the crime. And then what that is done is that's shared through all the states involved and, and 
what are they looking for? They're looking for exactly what CODIS did here. It matched a DNA profile from an LA uh, sexual assault to a Maryland murder. And, and the, Scott, uh, I'm going to stop you for one sec because uh, STS Nation is always on top of it. And I did not see this, but multiple people, including Wendy B here, says that info from L.A. was updated and there was no sexual assault. The arm in that video has been confirmed as a young male related to this home invasion, sending so much love and prayers to the family. I'm hearing from multiple people that it is now not being considered a sexual assault. So uh, just since you were just mentioned that, what do you what do you make of that? That first the reports were sexual assault. And now they're saying it was not. And that that is now a, a young it, it was apparently just a, a home invasion. Now, what, what do you make of that, Scott? OK, so the, and, and we only go with the information that we're given. Right. And so the early onset was it was a sexual assault, home invasion. And and then um, and so you have that. Now, my thought is and these are the unknown questions, probably only known to to investigators. But what was it that DNA was used um, to be to to uh, be obtained? Was it a blood sample? Was it a semen sample? Was it something else? Was it um, sweat? Did perhaps the subject leave something behind where they say that's his? And so you and and then you obtain. So there's it'd be interesting to see what was actually used to uh, to get this DNA sample. But at the same time, it it had to have risen to the level of of a pretty substantial crime. For, for them to have obtained DNA and then put it into CODIS. So that's why, um, but, but there may be things that are held close to the vest because if, if it is in fact a juvenile victim, there are things that just can't, can't be released, right? So it may just be there, uh, some privacy issues as opposed to what it is or what it isn't. Um, so, so that's that's. I, I would like to actually see where that was updated. And again, are the Maryland authorities aware? And and so it's like one of those things that you should. Hey, those are things that should be coming from law enforcement and from the public information officer, et cetera, to say, okay, here here are the facts. They're not what we initially put out, and this is what uh, the updated information. Right. That that's. That's just pretty much should be the procedure. Um, with that being said, the VICAP will is is looking for all these things, getting to the facts as opposed to the speculations or the rumors, putting only facts into the case, and then looking for other. Um, so thereby, you're going to have VICAP reports from another state that's just sitting there waiting to be dived into. And the system is going to read itself where it's like, hey, there's a similar case out there. Let's take a look at it and see what they have, um, et cetera. There may be a case that's lying dormant uh, because it's not a homicide, but it's something that's just got put put in a, um, in, in, a, in a file somewhere. And then VICAP can then revive that. That may be a missing piece to put all this together and ultimately identify a subject. And VICAP is this checklist um, that also triggers other resources. So, for example, uh, a more um, uh, detailed victimology report, a, a cast analysis, cellular analysis going through, looking at all the different databases to see if everything's being scrubbed and what can be used to here we're looking for the identity of a killer. So that's why, you know, that's that's the priority here. And um, and then if if another department somewhere in the country has something that um, you'll have detectives that are making a trip or a phone call to say, is this something that is going to take me closer to identifying my subject or is it something I can put on the back burner? And uh you know, you mentioned uh, cell phone analysis. That's one of the questions that Matt has, as well as about video uh, evidence. We'll get to that in a moment. But uh, Doug uh, and again, uh, Scott and Doug, both great guys, both investigators here who are top of their game. And uh, I'm hoping at the end of the show, 
I'll be able to connect all four of these guys and, uh, you know, maybe they can all work in concert to try to catch this guy, which is uh, the other reason both Scott and Doug are here. But, um, Doug, one of the things you look at as well is offender behavior and linkage analysis. What does that mean in terms of offender behavior? Uh, what are you looking at here? So offender behavior, I'm looking at what the, what the you know, what the behavior of the offender, what, what they've done at the crime scene, uh, how they've selected, how they've gone through their uh, victim selection, um, their everything from their MO to if there's a signature, um, their, their, their journey to crime, just everything, whether it's behaviorally or whether it's um, spatially, um, how they've gone about carrying out this crime. Um, now for, for linkage analysis, uh, again, like, you know, traditionally people think of behavioral profiling and they're thinking of the psychoanalytic um, side of it. The, you know, the stuff that Pat Brown does and she, and she, and she's very good at it. Um, again, I look at the, you know, the other side of it, the, the spatial, temporal, environmental, and geographic side of it primarily. Um, so when I'm doing a linkage analysis, rather than linking crime strictly through behavior, I'm linking it through space and time as well. Um, now, the, the greater distance you have, well, I mean, we're, when I say we, everybody, we're just, we're very lucky that there was a DNA hit, like Scott said, like Scott uh, said, um, if, uh, if, if there was no DNA hit, we would have never been able to link these crimes, um, because there's nothing that identifies that, that links the crime in Maryland to the crime in LA, um, now, if there was a, a very specific MO or signature, uh, you, you might be able to do that, but we, we don't have that here. Um, so the, the DNA is what did that. Some of the, some of the terms I've seen used in, in various media platforms here, uh, we just, you know, just kind of have to be cleared up. I've, you know, the, the fact that he might have an anchor point in one or the other. Well, we don't know anchor point yet. You know, in order to have an anchor point, you have to have a cluster. We don't have a cluster here. We don't have a cluster of crimes. We have one and one. So there is no anchor point. It could be a one-off. They could, he could have been, it, it, if, the, if the person in the video is the killer, he could have just been visiting Maryland one, one time. Or he could have been visiting LA one time. We don't know that yet. Um, so some of the stuff that I look at is, uh, you know, is, is one of the things I look at is, space and place and I, I mentioned this at one point in uh on x twitter um and i'm looking for if the, if i have two different crimes like this that are linked across the country you know vast geography space in between i'm trying to figure out you know which one's place and which one's space and when i say that i mean space is more abstract and place is more personal okay like a place for each of us is our office, our bedroom, our car, our hometown, um, you know, space would be more abstract, a place you visit, you know, once a year or a place that you've just gone to for business or, you know, outside of your activity space, your awareness space. Um, and, you know, activity space is the best way to define it is if you close your eyes, can you navigate around your town? You know, that's place, that's personal, that's your activity space. Awareness space, if you close your eyes, yeah, you can pick out certain landmarks, but you can't navigate the roads. That's more abstract. So you're trying to figure out which one is place and space here. And in doing so, you have a you're gonna you have a better idea of which place is maybe this person's residence and which place may be a place that he visited or he has an anchor point or he's gone to for some reason. And that can change the how your investigation unfolds um, and what methods and techniques you use in each place. Uh, so that's kind of one thing that I'd be looking at here. Um, but it, it's, it's important to, you know, to realize what you're looking at here. You're, you're not looking at a serial killer. I mean, he could be, but we don't know that yet. You know, there's one murder if this is the person. Um, you're not looking at a serial rapist. There was no sexual assault that we know of in L.A. They said there wasn't, and they haven't said whether there was sexual assault in Rachel's case or not. Um, and that's important for investigators, too, 
because that can lead you down a whole bunch of different rabbit holes and it can take away from Rachel's investigation if you start allocating resources to something that's not there. So it's very important that you define the crime as to what it is. And as it develops, as it unfolds, then you look into those leads and you branch your investigation. And it's also very important to run concurrent investigations. You can't just look into one person. You need to be looking into persons of interest, which I'm sure law enforcement is doing. And generally they do. Um, but, uh, you know, just one, lastly here, one crime or one, uh, you know, that, uh, that I was involved in briefly with a private investigator for the family was, uh, was Jennifer Kessie's case. And I'm sure a lot of people here know that case, but it's, uh, it, it all came down to CCTV, a video just like this. You couldn't see the person's face. You saw them walking. And that person's been pinpointed as the killer. Well, he may not have been the killer. We don't know. He dumped the vehicle, but he may or may not have been the killer. Um, and one piece of evidence that I hope the that law enforcement has and has identified properly um, is that DNA. You know, there's there's a lot of ways DNA can end up on a person from another person, whether it's direct contact, indirect contact, sexual. There's a lot of different ways. And I just hope that the that law enforcement in this case has identified that this is without a doubt identifies this person in the video as being the killer, because now that they've identified him to the public as that. So it's uh, it's so, you know, those are some of the things just going back quickly that I look at when I look at the. You know, when I relate to offender behavior and linkage analysis, I'm looking to connect those crimes in different ways to connect them um, wherever they may be. Uh, very, very interesting points. Uh, the only issue is it's obviously uh, all of this takes a tremendous amount of time and it's painstaking and that's super difficult on the families. Uh, I am not T pain is one of our moderators, Nate. Uh, she wants to know your favorite quality about Rachel. Someone else wants to know her favorite color uh, so they can share that that color uh which uh sts nation is great at but what about uh favorite quality first oh <clears throat> kind person she she had general empathy um for the most part could, could read your emotions pretty well and you know whether you're sad or, or you're trying to um celebrate over something she had the ability to just either make you feel better or help you indulge in the good times that you were having. And, you know, she, she'd be a little spacey sometimes, but you know, when she was being serious, um, her empathy would come out and she could relate to you and just be like right there in the moment with you um, and do whatever she can to, to raise your spirits and just kind of be like, Hey, you know, it's just life, baby, you know? And that was one of the things I always appreciated about her um, in, in a large family. And, you know, with having a, uh, quite a few siblings, the dynamics between everybody is completely different. And one of the favorite ones I had is uh, she was always one that I could talk to about, you know, real things. And it went both ways. She'd call me about things and things I didn't want to talk about. because She was my sister, but um, you know, just to be able to have that communication and to get to a point of depth and understanding, um, you know, probably one of the, the greatest things I've seen shine out of her. And her favorite color? <laughs> I'm a dude. Idea? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Matt, any idea on color? I do have an idea. Uh, I don't know if it's her favorite color, but uh, I know when we were together, she really liked orange roses. And uh, her uh, second oldest child um, said that uh, uh, tiger lilies were her favorite flower. And both of those are orange. Yep. Um, so orange is the color I would go with can only deduce uh, that it's orange. Uh, Matt, to you, did she walk the same trail every day? And uh, that's an interesting question because uh, uh, it could, you know, obviously be important to an investigation. But as far as you know, was she on that trail uh, daily? I don't know if it was every day, but I know she was an avid runner. As far back as I can remember, uh, she ran a lot. Um, so she was very familiar with this trail. Uh, I know she very much in 
love this trail, but I, I can't say seven days a week she was on this trail because I, I don't know that. Um, but it was definitely frequent. Uh, shout out to McSpunky, uh, gentleman here, uh, gifting, uh, surviving the survivor membership. So I appreciate that. Uh, Matt, back to you on this. Um, you know, we traded some emails ahead of this and, uh, one, two of the things that you really want to know, uh, relate to, uh, video evidence because they collected some video, uh, as well as cell data. Why don't you tell the, uh, STS nation audience about that? And I was surprised to hear from you that, uh, you did some of your own research and that cell phone, or I should say ring, uh, like doorbell camera, uh, footage wasn't even obtained or asked for till a month into the investigation. So what, what did you want to make about those two points? Um, well, I, I had organized uh, three separate canvassing events where we fanned out from the trailhead to hand out the flyers that was uh, previously displayed on screen uh, just to make sure that everybody in the area was aware uh, uh, of what had happened, maybe generate some tips, locate somebody who, who knew uh, the individual. Uh, and during uh, the second canvassing, uh, I spoke to a couple of individuals that lived pretty close to the trail and they had commented that the day after our first canvassing, uh, the police had been uh, going door to door asking for uh, any kind of video footage uh, that residents might have, you know, doorbell camera uh, footage. Uh, I don't know what other, other type of footage they may have received. I know Sheriff Geller has said that they've received hundreds of hours of footage, uh, but that would have put uh, their collection efforts right around the month mark for, for Rachel's murder. So I was a bit disappointed that it took them a month to, to start canvassing the area looking for that. Uh, it's now been over two months. So I'm, I'm guessing they've had a lot of this uh, footage, you know, four to six weeks at this point. Um, I don't know if they're using any kind of AI uh, to see if there's any kind of interesting information or if they have uh, detectives just looking through the video, you know, piece by piece, seeing if they, they see anything. Um, but that's where the video came from. Um, uh, I do have a question also about the, the cell phone data. I know that the police are trying to compare cell data from Bel Air and LA and see if they can find a common link. A question I have with that is if they do find a common link, uh, will they be able to actually do anything with that? Uh, if you find one individual that was in both places, will they be able to get a search warrant to identify that person and get their DNA? Or is it just too random of data uh that's a great question for scott duffy scott the question is once again uh they know he was in la if they can find the same number in la at that time as uh the phone number that would have been in bel air maryland around august 5th uh can they execute a search warrant based on that there there you can you can continue to build a case to, in order to get a search warrant so you know, cell phone data from, and it's always changing and, ha and, and always having relied on experts during my career and some close friends of mine are, are in that cast unit. The, um, the cell phone tower dumps are time specific. And I don't know as, as things start to disappear as, you know, it's tremendous amount of data. Just imagine every second of the day a tower is just receiving a tremendous amount of information from every phone that's coming and going. So the, um, I would hope that that tower dump in and around where the LA, uh, for whatever the LA incident took place, that, that, that has been preserved because you can, you can reach out to all the, uh, cell phone providers and say, hold that data. And so they'll take it, they'll, they'll, they'll freeze it, they'll hold it. And then once law enforcement writes that search warrant, then they'll receive that data. So that's the first thing. So that way, at least they preserve the information. Um, so it would be great. I can tell you as an investigator, having done exactly that and not between LA and Maryland, but between Delaware and PA and Delaware and Maryland having cases where I have a, where I know where our people were. And then 
looking and hoping and praying out of the thousands and literally thousands, if not millions, pieces of data. Of course, it's all being thrown uh, into a software through through this analysis that, um, boom, you only have one one phone that's connecting. And then, of course, um, there are things that a, a detective can do right from their desktop without having to worry about search warrants. Why? Because pretty much everything now is uh, a cell phone. So if I if I want to um, get a subscription, it's a cell phone number they're asking for. So, and companies are flooding these these databases that are readily available um, to the public and to law enforcement. And so you can run cell phone through a couple of different databases and come up with some really viable hits. Now, it it comes up as a hit, and then that detective is then of course doing everything in their power to, you know, come up with a passport, a driver's license, ID, a yearbook photo, if it takes going back to a yearbook and saying, are we on the right track or is this something different? And then, and, and like genealogy, are we, you know, are you getting the person or are you getting a relative? And then, and it takes detective work to figure out, is there a connection with the image we think we have from LA being the, the person who went into Maryland and, and, it, it, it's time consuming, but as Douglas said, all these things are hopefully being done contemporaneously through different experts and resources available to that department. So it would be, it, it, my, I would not be getting sleep. I'd be like, get me that information now. And if, and if they're like, hey, only one cell phone was common between LA and Maryland at the time that are relevant, I'd be like, okay. Um, game over. That's what I would be thinking. And, and of course, you know, you take a deep breath and you do your homework. Um, the, the, the likelihood there may be a couple of different connections, but ultimately if, if you can narrow it down, it, it's good. It's not, it doesn't mean it's happening, but it is good that, um, that lead. And, and, and it could be a lead like that, that took somebody to DC. Perhaps that phone is traveling different people, but um, th those are the things that are happening behind the scenes. Uh, Nate, besides the obvious questions of who is this guy and where is he, what are the biggest questions you have right now in your head, uh, you know, surrounding this case? Um, really hard to say, you know, because when everything started, you know, it's, it's all for hunting the leads and, and gathering information. And then, you know, step two is, you know, breaking it down, going over in it, you know, trying to find a direction for these guys to take. Um, so it's kind of like, you know, I can understand the process it takes, even in today's world with all the crazy technology we have, you know, people are still getting away with, you know, murder, you know, all the time. So I think more than questions, I just have a lot of hope that they are doing, you know, everything they really can do behind the scenes, you know, not just because it was my sister, but, you know, it was a heinous, heinous crime. And, you know, you don't want this to happen to anyone, especially in a town like Bel Air, you know, all across the world, you know? So I guess, you know, my question is like, are these guys really doing what they're supposed to do? And I'm just going to stick with hope for right now that they are and just trust and pray that, you know, the process will work out and, you know, very soon, you know, if anything, just more answers, um, more information, um, keep it pouring. So the story keeps going. And then, you know, that glorious day when whoever this is, is in that courtroom and that hammer comes down and we can just have that sigh of relief. Uh, well put, you know, Nate, I uh, hope we become friends from this. We talked for the first time last night. Uh, obviously you've been through a lot with your wife dying from cancer, your baby from SIDS. Um, and you seem so level headed and like such a great guy, uh, which says a lot about Rachel, uh, just, you know, de facto that you're her brother. But how do you how are you keeping it all together right now? Do you have a deep faith? Uh, are you just an optimistic person. Are you good at covering it up? Uh, what's keeping you together and 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 uh, it, sort of in this very um, Zen like state that I find you in? Um. So our childhood was, was pretty tough, rough, um, not in like a bad way. Just, you know, we, we grew up in a low income area and it was just tough times. And, um, 
my mom, you know, she brought us to church every Sunday, um, you know, Wednesday night stuff, youth group stuff. And, you know, I really, I got into the Bible and I really trusted and believed, you know, what God was saying. And <clears throat> the more and more that I grew in my relationship um, with God, the more I understand that, you know, he says, you know, we're in this world, but we're not of this world. You know, this, this is, this isn't our home. Um, and unfortunately that there's sin, there's evil in this world and, and that's not of God. Um, and no matter what happens, like just relying on him and having faith. And it's hard to have faith when you're going through some of these things. Like why? Like this doesn't, I'm just a simple guy, simple family, man. Like this doesn't happen to us. Like, you know, um, and just realizing that, you know, keeping your faith and growing in your faith allows you to maintain a, a state of um, clarity and logic um, and to be there to help others, to not to not lose it emotionally. Um, don't get me wrong. I have my nights where um, I'm by myself in the dark and pillow in my face. Um, and in those broken moments, just praying and just still trusting God and just knowing like through all of this, you know, it may not have been his will, um, but it happened. And, you know, you got to carry on and you got to help and support the ones around you. You know, it's like in any situation, you know, if you play sports or if you're in the military, you know, you're a group, you're a family. You know, if one goes down, you know, we all lift them up. And, you know, that's just what I'm trying to do, who I'm trying to be um, and just show that, you know, you can have, <clears throat> you know, this time to grieve, but still stay strong and do what you need to do for the people around you. And uh, you told me that you're kind of the uh, de facto patriarchal figure in your family. Now I understand why, because if I had issues uh, and I got a bunch of years on you, I'm definitely going to you. Uh, so I might be calling you myself uh, with my own issues soon, Nate. So you might have gotten yourself in trouble. Uh, Scott, back to you, and then we'll That's circle okay. back. To <laughs> if you guys are good to go, keep going. I'm, I'm good to keep going. I, I think this is really fascinating. Hope no one's uh, upset that we've got five of us in here but i think uh it's an interesting balance um but scott one of the things that's been talked about um of course is igg that investigative genetic genealogy and i'm happy to put matt and nate in touch with barbara ray venter who is the godmother she of uh, igg she helped solve the golden state killer case a serial rapist um so uh i'm happy to put you guys in touch with her but scott duffy are they doing investigative genetic genealogy? The database is much smaller or harder uh, as it pertains to Latinos because there's not as much information in there. But are they doing IgG, do you think? And should they be doing IgG? Definitely should be, right? The, um, and I don't, I don't know if they are. And that would be one of the things if, if the VICAP services were utilized that um, – that, genealogy would be one of those things. Hey, is this fitting? Yes, you have DNA. No, you don't have DNA. So then you take genealogy out of it. But here I would say definitely should. My absolute hope is it is being done, if not through the FBI, definitely through so many different, very reliable uh, experts who are out there. And uh, but But that is the time-consuming piece it is very lengthy and not only that um you know as as you've already alluded the is it is is there anything there that um that they can follow up on because of a limited database depending on a cultural aspect but you won't know until you try so hopefully that that is being done and if there are if there are pieces where they are getting hits of something somewhere in that family tree, then um, an investigator is doing their due diligence. But it is that's the time-consuming piece. Here comes all the orange, Copper Horse, Derby Shear, Chelsea Whitaker, Hope Eight Fear, Ava Hackshaw, Tiff Knox, Baby Dawes, who I love, STS, uh, Nate and Matt, my own father passed away from old age, thankfully. Uh, not that he passed away, but, uh, you know, it was 
It's never uh, the right time, but he was close to 90, and uh, STS Nation was there for me. So these guys are going to be here for you, and we're going to definitely keep going now for a little while because I think this is very important, but we're going to get you guys back on soon to keep the story out there. Someone did ask, uh, Nate, if you feel like the media, um, you know, they the, the person who asked the question said, the story was all over the press and I've been, you know, I'm, I was on the other side of that fence, um, but they start to lose interest. Do you feel like the press and media has, uh, you know, has lost a little bit of interest because so much time has passed? Um, I'm going to say yes, because, you know, the direction that the case goes, I feel if the information is still going out, the direction the case goes is how the media is going to respond. If it's slowing down, the media is going to slow down. Um, that's why you get these little quick little inserts here and there. Um, if new information comes out and the media is still getting it, it's still out there, you know, in the public, then you know, there might be a spike, but, um, you know, it's, it's the media, they got to play what's going to, you know, get the viewers on. And if this case dies down and there's nothing to talk about, you know, unfortunately you could see a decline in her story. Uh, and that's what we're going to try to help with is to keep it uh, front and center. Matt, one of the things you told me. Uh, to that point is day one of this uh, horrific murder and, and scene. There was, you said 10 detectives, but at last count uh, there was about a half dozen or six detectives. Does that dishearten you in any way? Oh, it absolutely does. Um, it makes me wonder why they, they are not uh, still going with the 10 detectives. I, I get that there's other crime that needs uh, to be solved. Um but when I also hear uh, that they have a lot of video that they need to sort through and a lot of cell phone data that they uh, potentially need to sort through and that it's going to take a lot of time, uh, I have a little bit of uh, trouble reconciling uh, the, the mountain of data they say they need to sort through and then the reduction of resources assigned to the case. Uh, and the last I had heard, um, that was the, the about a half a dozen detectives was, you know, that was about a month ago. And I was a bit disheartened, disheartened to hear that it was termed as about half a dozen, because I would think that if the number is in the single digits, you should be able to give an exact number, not an approximation. Um, so how it was represented, uh, I wasn't too, too thrilled with uh, either. And one of the things you pointed out on uh, her more recent photo, she's wearing an Apple watch, but you don't know. Um, and we can defer to the investigators here. I assume they've got to be looking at data from that Apple watch, but have you heard anything regarding that? Um, specifically, uh, what's the, I heard the question, but sp uh, what with the, uh, the Apple watch, she you ran know with her Apple watch on, uh, yeah. I know that that was her habit. Um, and, and do you know if they have, you know, looked at that watch, sort of did an autopsy, if you will, on that watch. Do you have any idea? Uh, I have not received specific comments about that from the detectives. Um, I am not trying to be evasive, but I'm also trying not to say anything that is potentially not public. Yeah, I definitely don't want you to do that. But uh, Scott, and I'm going to get back to Doug in a second, but Scott, uh, in 2023, how valuable is an Apple Watch that's being worn? Well, it's it's another piece of technological evidence or potential evidence. And whether it be an Apple Watch Fitbit, Apple Watch probably having a little bit more to capture. You know, it, it, it can capture everything from heart rate. It can, there is always a downside, in it, but the forensically it can, um, you know, uh, uh, specify a time for example if you if, if she's on a run and this is her pattern this is her heart rate and then all of a sudden now begins the attack of course the heart rate's going to go up so if you know you it's it's all helpful in the sense that um it can get you down to to a specific very specific time um give you a uh, um uh, other pieces of data that it, it all depends what, what the Apple watch is loaded with. So it's, it's, um, it's helpful. It's useful. And there's, there's no doubt in my mind, um, that, that it's, it it would be, uh, provided to, to a proper expert in order to do a forensic analysis of it. It would, um, 
just just no doubt in my mind. Uh, Patricia Burns, quite frankly, I'm livid with the lack of movement towards justice for Rachel. So I can't imagine what the family must be feeling uh, followed here by uh, has Rachel's reward information flyer been translated to Spanish for the Latin community there. Uh, Nate, um, we we had a Randolph Rice on uh, obviously the family attorney, and he says that they you know, they ran the digital campaign in Spanish. But do you know, Nate, are they handing things out um, in Spanish to the greater community? Um, this will be a two part here. I'll, I'll pass the second half uh, off to Matt. Um, I know with Randolph's um, marketing, uh, online marketing um, to the Hispanic uh, community uh, to bring in clientele, he had utilized that to do a digital campaign um, in the area. And then there was the, the canvassing, Matt, if you want to pick up on that. Sure. Um, uh, the, the flyer that you had up on the screen, uh, that's been uh, translated in Spanish since uh, before it was even released. Uh, I held off on releasing that until a friend of mine who lives in Puerto Rico and is uh, bilingual uh, translated that into Spanish. Uh, the PDF I sent to you actually has two pages. Page two is uh, the Spanish translation. Um, on our very first canvassing, um, I only had the English version uh, just because I didn't know how many volunteers were going to show up. Uh, I didn't want to run out of flyers uh, and I didn't realize uh, how few uh, members, uh, Spanish speaking members of the Hispanic community knew about the crime. So I went with English only, even though we had Spanish. Um, then on the, uh, the second and third canvassing, we started handing out uh, double sided flyers, English on one side, Spanish on the other just to ensure that no matter who received the flyer uh, would be able to read all of the information. Uh, but yes, that flyer is absolutely uh, available in Spanish. And I will, again, I'm going to put that out on Twitter at podcast STS at podcast STS and on Instagram surviving the survivor on Instagram uh, at surviving the survivor. So please everybody uh, give me a follow there and you guys can help circulate uh, those uh, flyers in both English and Spanish. Doug, a uh, lot of acronyms here uh, related to DNA, uh, CPTED, OSINT, GEOINT, what all these acronyms mean and how do you use them uh, to help catch perpetrators like Rachel's killer? So SEPTED, CPTED, is crime prevention through environmental design. And that's a that's a component of environmental criminology. Um, in and what what SEPTED is is it's it's designing environments to make them safe. So obviously, you know, when we when we build a school, it's you know you build it a little uphill, you build a winding path up to the front door, you have the front office can see everybody coming and going. Um, shopping malls, they might have video surveillance. Uh, prisons, you design them so people can't escape to keep the community around safe. Um, but it goes to building communities as well. You know, uh, gated communities are, are generally very safe, not because they're gated, but because they have one entrance in and out. And any community you create with one entrance in and out is generally safer. Uh, if 911 is called, they just have to sit at the entrance, wait for the car to leave, for example. Um, in, in this case, with the Ma and Pa Trail, you know, there's there was very little human surveillance, meaning there's a lot of thick brush. Houses can't see the trail. It's not lit. Um, so if you're caught in there after dusk, I mean, even if you're caught in there during uh, I watched some YouTube videos during daylight hours and it's pretty dark in there with the brush. Um, it's it's a single trail. It's not a loop, um, which means the an offender, such as an offender in this case, knows you're coming back. If they know where you parked, they know you're returning. Um, now you might say, well, if it's a loop, they know you're going around and coming back to that parking lot as well. That's true, but you're always looking forward. You're always moving forward. You're not, there's not somebody behind you um, finding a way to ambush you where you can't see them. And now you're turning around and coming back into the unknown. So you're always moving forward. Um, and then this trail also has a choke point. The choke point is the underpass under the I-24 to the other side where it comes out on the other side. Um, so just looking at crime prevention through environmental design, that's some of the things you think of when 
creating a recreational area a park. So I'm sure that's what they're going to be doing now going back. They'll probably put video surveillance at this park. They may put some lighting in. Um, and those are things that they should do. OSINT and GeoInt. So those are two of the other activities that I perform as well. OSINT is open source intelligence and GeoInt is geospatial intelligence. Uh, I do a lot. Of, obviously, I need both of those to do geographic profiling. Um, but I also need them to find people, to find missing persons. And I do a lot of uh, OSINT behind the scenes um, for authors, uh, David Wilson, Peter Blexley. I've done uh, BBC Panorama. So I do a lot of OSINT for them to find people. When they need to find people for their investigations, their investigative journalism, I find those people for them and I apply these, um, these, uh, these, this skill set to doing that. Um, and, uh, so yeah. So if, uh, I mean, I, I can expand on that if you like, if there's any more questions on that, but, uh, in a, in a nutshell, those, that's what those are. Yeah. If, uh, Nate or Matt have any questions, mm -hmm. I'll, I'll let them have at it. Um, a few more things. I don't want to overburden, uh, Matt or Nate. I don't care about Scott or Doug. No, it's not true. I care about Scott and Doug too, but, uh, um, Matt, one of the things you wanted to talk about, we talked about it briefly, but I just want to make sure that you flesh it out on your end is uh, the attack location. And you believe it was pre-selected. Uh, you also talked about tunnels that no one knows about. Just um, sort of elaborate on that. And uh, if you have any questions, we could toss them to Scott or, uh, or Doug sure. on that. Sure. Uh, I would like to reiterate that I have not been back on the trail uh, since that uh, Remembrance Walk where the flower, uh, flowers were, were put down, um, you know, along the, the, the side of the trail. Uh, Mike Morin uh, did, I guess, his own uh, investigation. He went back to the scene to take a look at everything. And he, uh, a lot of the information I have about the attack location comes from my conversations with Mike. But uh, in speaking with him, he believes where the attack happened. You can see a good distance in both directions of the trail. Uh, so the attacker would very clearly know that nobody was coming and that the, the tunnel where Rachel was found, nobody really, locals don't know about that tunnel. I didn't know about that tunnel. Um, I've heard from so many people that live in Bel Air saying that they've never heard of those tunnels. So I don't think it's very likely that there just happened to be an attack at that location. And then this attacker just happened to find that tunnel that's off of the trail. I see no way that this location wasn't pre-selected. Uh, I know Pat Brown uh, strongly feels that this was just a, 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 an attack of opportunity. I have no uh, opinion whether or not this guy was waiting for Rachel specifically or just waiting for for whoever happened to come by, but I strongly believe the location was selected because of that information. And Matt Tiff wants to know, as a friend of the show, are the flyers specifically up at her gym? Um, some businesses, uh, I would have to say no. I, I've heard, I don't want to company shame uh, anybody, but uh, I was specifically told that the, the, the brand gym that she uh, went to uh, did not allow having those flyers uh, posted. Uh, there were uh, three different locations that she would sometimes go to. Um, and it's my understanding, none of those locations uh, would have the, were willing to have the flyer posted. Ladies and gentlemen, this is why I don't do not like corporate America. They do not bend the rules when they should bend the rules for stuff like that. Um, you, you're talking about company shaming. But Matt, you also wanted to bring up some victim shaming. Some of the things that keep coming up, and I've seen it in the chat a little bit, is that Rachel was on a you know a bunch of dating sites, and that she was maybe meeting someone. Uh, what would you like to say regarding that? I'd like to thoroughly squash that. Uh, I've already said that uh, she was completely head over heels in, in love with Richard. Uh, she wanted this to work. Uh, I have no doubt that. Well, she wouldn't do anything to jeopardize that because one of the the things that Rachel really wanted in life was to be loved. She wanted to love somebody and to be loved. And if she found that person whom I believe she thought that she did, she wouldn't risk that. Um, 
and then let's not forget the fact that she she was parked at the ha- trailhead. She did actually go for a run. Uh, the the location I was just talking about is a it's a good half mile down the trail. Um, everything points to the fact that she was legitimately going for a run, and for people to assume that Rachel must have been doing something wrong, she must have been cheating. Um, I feel that that's victim shaming. You're saying that for this to happen to Rachel, she must have been immoral or doing something wrong, something that she shouldn't have been doing when all of the facts point that she was just going for a run and she, and she was murdered. Um, Doug, there was one other thing that's of interest to me and then we'll start to wrap it up, but uh, terminology and media, uh, what does that mean? How does it relate to what you do as a geo profiler? Uh, yeah, I, I went over some of it uh, a bit earlier, just in the, uh, in the, in the, you know, the terminology, the, the phrases, uh, that the media has been using on different platforms, um, such as, you know, he's, this individual has been called a serial rapist and a serial killer. Um, and just, you know, clarifying some of those and the anchor point term I saw a couple times, um, in terms of how the investigation's unfolding, uh, you know, I, I did see somebody in the chat here and they asked, and sorry, I can't reply in the chat because I'm not logged in on YouTube, I guess. Um, but they they asked me if, you know, that this type of person could progress to becoming a serial killer. And, you know, I don't, I don't want to be, I don't want to scare anybody or be morbid or anything like that. But, you know, accidents aside and professions aside, law enforcement military which obviously isn't isn't murder when they have to take a life um anybody that takes a life anybody that commits murder uh has the ability to commit murder again if that same incentive or motive present presents itself Uh, and that's just reality um you know there's there's a lot of different reasons why people commit murder um but, but that's just reality. So, and I know that when we talk about a serial killer, we talk about most people generally think of sexual homicide, but in, but the, you know, the definition is two or more murders. So uh, with, you know, the definition expands, but in it's briefly as two or more murders. So could this person become a serial killer that committed this crime? Yeah, they, they could, or maybe they already are. We don't know. Um, And, uh, but, you know, just, I just wanted to, so I wanted to reply to that and I wanted to, uh, comment briefly on, on what Matt was saying on the, on the location, the, I've looked at that, that, that location pretty, um, pretty intensely just using GIS, um, Google earth and a couple different GIS platforms. And, uh, and, you know, like he said, it's a, it's a half mile from the, from the parking lot. Um, it's the, the, and I agree with what he said. There's, there's no way that someone's going to, you know, carry a, a person, a body, a half mile down a trail to, to leave that, per, to leave that body there. Um, these tunnels are hard to find. Um, it's a, it's, uh, from what I, I, I believe I know the location as many people might, it looks like it's the drainage tunnels that go under the highway. Um, that I believe the Creek is called heavenly waters and it, you can't see it from the trail. Um, and, but what, what I'm looking for is, you know, and and, and what I do is, you know, being able to place her on that trail, you know, being, and I hope they do figure out who those five or six witnesses, potential witnesses were that were at the, at the trail at that time. And that somebody can, say they saw her at a specific time going a specific direction is also important um, because there are two points. There are two uh, geographic points in there or points of interest that are of interest to me in what I do. One of them is right where the trail goes under the I-24. There's a, a maintained vehicle exit off the i-24 onto the mom Paw trail and that's maintained and that's only 300 yards from where her body was found 
So that's very much of interest to me because it's a point of access and it's close to where the body was found, where Rachel's body was found. Um, and then the other point of interest to me is that the Mon Pa Trail runs right by Anna's house. And I would like to know more about Anna's house for what I do. Um, it's a, it's a, it's a homeless shelter. It's used for uh, emergency services for families escape and women escaping domestic violence. Um, so, you know, that place is of interest as well. Cause it's right. It's, you know, meters from where she was found as well. Um, and it may have nothing to do with it, but these are just some of the things that I look at when, uh, when, when I create, you know, my profile. Wow. That's fascinating. Had, had I never heard Anna's house. Is that what you said? I'd never heard of yeah. that. Yes. Um, so the work that Doug does is uh, next level, uh, very fascinating profile in the geography, if you will, hence the geo profile, or you can find him on Twitter under that handle. Um, Nate, to you, this is an interesting question, and I don't even know if you want to answer it, because if you know the answer, uh, I, I don't know. But uh, do you know if Rachel ever posted photos of that specific location before where they found her? Um, no. Um, I can't say, you know, 100% definitely. But uh, like Matt was saying earlier, we grew up a stone's throw from that trailhead. Um, I spent... I'd say a good part of my twenties, um, living down in that area. And, you know, I'd frequently run with Rachel, um, our brother, John, brother, Mike, and, you know, we'd get out there and just, it's just the boys we're all in our twenties. So we were stomping through the woods, flipping over rocks and trying to look for snakes and, you know, whatever else just to, you know, blow off some steam. And, uh, I never knew those tunnels were even there. And we, we messed around in those woods pretty good. And, you know, there'd be no reason if you saw the location, you would understand there's no reason to, you know, even take a photo of that area. It's, it's a kind of a U shaped turn that you're heading straight towards 24 and then a U shapes to go parallel with it. And it's a real murky, um, Creek, the, the heavenly waters Creek. And it just kind of disappears into the woods and then it just takes you up the trail. So it's not a real impressive or beautiful place. <laughs> um, and there'd be no reason to stand there, take a photo or whatever else. Um, by the way, someone pointed out, you've got orange flowers right behind you there, Nate. So uh, the man upstairs or the woman upstairs is watching. Uh, Hope ate fear. Um, I did not know about the homeless shelter. That makes two of us. That's really interesting to me. Uh, Doug McGregor, bring in the receipts, better known as the geo profiler. He's a forensic behavioral analyst and a consultant specializing in geographic profiling. Uh, he has a master's of science from Missouri State University. And uh, who knows? He does pro bono work. I'm going to connect all these guys via email after the show. So maybe Doug can help um, both Matt and Nate. Uh, Doug, your final thoughts on today's conversation. Uh, my final thoughts are, you know, just obviously I hope they – they catch this individual soon. Um, I, I think there's a good chance of that now that they have the DNA. So that's very positive and that's something to think about um, to uh, you know, to Nathan and Matt, just the, with all the families I've, I've worked with the ones that, you know, that keep moving forward with those, with solving those crimes are the ones that just keep on the law enforcement and that find somebody within that agency that that wants to stay in touch and that constantly updates them um so you know and those are the ones that that where they keep moving forward they keep getting updated they keep getting information and and, and it stays you know within focus so um i you know i i you know my sympathies to what happened um and uh and i hope it uh i hope you get you know some resolution very soon. And uh, Doug from Patricia Burns, she wants to know if she saw you on Citizen Detective. Got to ask. Yeah, I've, I've I've been on that show several times. Yeah. There you go. Got the best guest in all true crime, better community. Uh, Scott Duffy. Um, my, I might get some mail saying Scott didn't talk enough, but obviously the focus <laughs> today was on uh, 
Nate and Matt, but uh, sometimes I get heat that I let Phil talk too much and Scott, not enough. And Scott and Phil are coming back on Friday. We're going to talk a little bit about Ellen Greenberg and then the other big cases of the week Friday at 5 p.m. But Scott Duffy, uh, your final thoughts today on what we just discussed. Yeah, I just just I want you to to know that um, with all the negative things that could be out there with not maybe not getting enough information or just just accept that as part of sometimes the the failures to communicate in law enforcement. And with that being said, know that there are are absolute things being done. And I don't I don't think um, I don't just just from what I know of Harford County sheriffs and and then the surrounding departments that um, they are putting everything possible. I would hope that they have opened up that line of communication uh, a little bit better going forward. And so keep the pressure on them. Um, it's good. It's good. And there's nothing negative that will come out of that. And you can tell them specifically, tell us that you're doing, th that you're doing things, but you can't tell us what you're doing because X, Y, and Z. And, and that should be sufficient. So um, keep the pressure and um, absolutely know he will be found, period. And, and so God bless you guys and all the best for sharing such a beautiful story. And uh, you're hearing that from uh, a veteran FBI supervisory agent. Uh, shout out to Ned Smith. He gifted five surviving the survivor memberships during this show. So appreciate that very much. Uh, Nate Morin, Rachel's brother, a uh, stand-up guy. I'm hoping that he and I stay friends uh, well beyond this once they catch this guy, which uh, Scott says that they will, and I have no doubt that they're going to do that. Uh, Nate, any final questions for either Scott or Doug while you have them? Uh, no, not this time. Um, it'd be great to connect with you guys <clears throat> after this. Um, I do want to say, I think this has been a very good panel tonight. Um, I think it's gone pretty smoothly. Um, a great show. And again, thank you uh, for having me and, you know, pleasure meeting you too. Very thankful for you being on the show and talking with us today. And uh, Nate, my final question to you, and I'm about to ask Matt the same two questions, but how can we help you? What can we do for you and the Morin family? Um, let's stay in contact. Um, <laughs> let's kind of, uh, digress from this one and, you know, just kind of rethink the process and digest, you know, the information and the conversation and then bring it back around fresh. And, you know, let's just keep banging on this thing. You know, let's keep Rachel's story alive until we find this guy. hundred percent. We're going to do that here at STS. Uh, we're going to get Matt and uh, Nate. They've got an open door here, uh, whenever they want to come in. Uh, and, uh, that is, uh, couldn't make that any more clear. Matt McMahon, uh, he is father to Rachel's oldest child. Um, Matt, uh, any final questions for either Scott or Doug? Uh, I don't have any questions, but I, I would like to thank uh, uh, everybody uh, for their time. Uh, tonight is uh, extremely important to me just to make sure that Rachel's name does uh, stay out there, like Nate was just saying, and that people don't forget because that's the only way I believe that we're going to catch this guy. Uh, so thank you. And uh, same final question to you. Uh, what what can we do as a community to try to help you? Um, you know, we're going to we're going to continue to stay on the story. But is there anything else that we could do? Just continue staying on the story. Uh, I, I think that's about all, all we could really ask. All right. Well, uh, really appreciate uh, Nate and Matt making time. And of course, Scott is going to be back Friday at 5 p.m. Eastern time. Doug McGregor quickly becoming a very prominent best guest on STS. Uh, really, uh, this personally, by the way, I hate when people say me personally because it's redundant, but personally, this is uh, one of the more uh, important shows that I think that we have done and uh, one that's really touched my heart, especially hearing Nate's story about his wife and his kid and just the unbelievable uh, attitude that he continues to have through all this. So, uh, Big, huge fan of uh, Nate Morin and Matt McMahon and obviously the two other guests. Uh, just a quick programming note. Tomorrow night at uh, 7 p.m. Eastern time, we've got Tara Malik and Gene Fisher. 
who is the longest serving prosecutor in Ada County. There's a lot going on with Brian Koberger and uh, the Idaho Four. a lot of craziness coming out of Idaho. We haven't been on that massive story in a long time. So we're getting back to that. And again, Scott and Phil are going to talk briefly about Ellen Greenberg, which is a whole other uh, crazy case. And by the way, Josh and Sandy Greenberg are going to be live on News Nation with Ashley Banfield at 10 p.m. tonight. So if you want to support them, please watch. It's all about the victims, not about us, but all about the victims. So uh, Matt and Nate, please let us know how we can help. Until next time, love you, America. Love you, Bel Air, Maryland. Love you, Delaware. Love you, Philly. Love you, Canada, Tasmania, the Republic of Ireland. And tonight, of course, we are also thinking about Israel. Keep them in our thoughts and prayers. Uh, panel, hang on one second. I'm supposed to do one final thing here. Hang on. Later, everybody. Hey.